author, columnist, managing editor of LibertyNation.com, podcast host and conservative policy advocate. We dismiss history at our peril. Liberty Nation Radio with Mark Angelides. Hello and welcome to Liberty Nation Radio, heard coast to coast on the Radio America Network. I'm your host, Mark Angelides. On today's action-packed show, we'll be examining the minds and motivations of the progressive movement and how that relates to cultural Marxism, digging deep into Donald Trump's latest announcement on the abortion debate, and a whole lot more. Remember, this show is proudly sponsored by LibertyNation.com, where you can access podcasts, breaking news, analysis, and a range of biting and brilliant shows to whet your appetite for freedom and your fondness for the great American constitution. If it seems America is on the progressive road, we just have to ask, progressing towards what? Now, that's a question that Liberty Nation senior political analyst, Mr. Tim Donner, also happens to be a longtime host of this here radio show, uh, discussed in a very recent article on the pages of LibertyNation.com called The Progressive Agenda, Destroy America in Order to Save It. It's well worth a read. I recommend you head over there after you've listened to this. Tim, thanks for being here. Always a pleasure, Mark. Thanks. So, Tim, we were discussing uh, just before we came online here uh, that the one area where you allow yourself a, a hint of spiciness, let's call it, a hint of spiciness, is when dissecting the progressive agenda. And I, I really want to dig into to what the progressive mindset really is, but perhaps more specifically, how has it managed to overtake policy positions in what used to be a fairly let, let's call, let's do a Joe Biden is what you, you, your grandpa's Democratic Party. How does it manage well, to take over? The, yeah, the point of demarcation was a George Floyd affair where progressives realized the opportunity in front of them. The country was in a state of chaos because of what. Officer Derek Chauvin had done to George Floyd and put his his knee down on his neck, the I can't breathe, and all the riots and the mobs that were set loose after that. What the progressive community, if you want to call it that, the progressive movement saw was an unparalleled opportunity to sow chaos, mm. to sow division, and to push for their vision of essentially, let's cut through the you know, through the nice language, a culturally Marxist society. I mean, the Black Lives Matter movement, lest we forget, was foisted upon us by who? Patricia Cullis. Two, two women, mm. self-proclaimed, trained Marxists. Yeah. Which trained does, by who is a, an important question there, right? <laughs> well, indeed. And, and how this overtook an entire mm. political party where this... This mindset, which is far from traditional liberalism, mm. where men can be women, women can be men, your identity is based strictly on your race. Everybody is either oppressed or an oppressor, created a total balkanization of the society, which is exactly mm. what a Marxist movement would do, is to create exploit existing yeah. tensions and take them to the max. That's what they did in 2020 when really this, the, the tragedy of that was that we were at a moment in time where everybody was ready for a genuine conversation about policing and racism. Everybody was ready, poised. They were listening. And instead of conducting that constructive conversation, and trying to get real police reform and associated legislation, what they did was they tore the country apart. They called for defunding the police. Uh, they called for the indoctr increasing indoctrination in classrooms. But the heart of my piece on LibertyNation.com is the stranglehold they have placed on the institutions, mm. organizations, agencies in and outside the government which were more than willing to simply cow in a cowardly fashion bend the knee and give millions of dollars to Black Lives Matter, which, of course, went bankrupt mm. shortly after 2020. Um, it, so let, let's be very clear that that is a protected form of bankruptcy. They still have the mansions. 
Yes, right. well, they still first, have the mansions. Yes, he self-proclaimed Marxist who headed the movement. Patricia Cullors lives in a mansion that I believe Mark has been valued at roughly six million dollars. Don't quote me on that, but it's a. It's you a, know, if if the New, if the New York uh, if New York Attorney General decided to value it, it's pr it's probably about one hundred and fifty bucks, though, right? Let's be fair. But this is this is what has led to. Letitia James mm. basically promising to and then fulfilling the promise to get Donald Trump, no matter what it took, using uh, an unprecedented application of the law for which there was no injured party. This is what's happened in Georgia with Fonnie Willis and targeting Trump and then adding, oh, by the way, we'll add 20 other defendants to it. This is what not liberalism, but mm. what progressivism has done to, to this country. And it is toxic. And it is something that has to be identified. This is not mainstream liberal democratic politics. And I'll tell you why. Baseline, Mark, these people do not like the Constitution. And they would like to get rid of it because it's way too democratic. They yeah. accuse Trump of being an autocrat, but what they want to do is take policies that are wildly unpopular and simply voice them on the American people and say, that's it. There's no debate. And if you disagree, you're evil. That's yeah. what the progressive movement has wrought in the United States of America. So, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong here, Tim, but based on what you're saying, are you suggesting that progressives are actually communists? I, I think that's a fair association. Um, excuse me, your words, not mine. <laughs> well, let, let's look at this way. It's the language. Let's, as you, put, it, let's yeah. put it this way. Here's a safe description. They are unabashed collectivists. Mm, yeah, okay. that's a good way to put it. But you, you talked about uh, how dividing it into oppressors and oppressees, uh, and that is very much straight out of Karl Marx. Uh, and then sure, you've yeah. got th this idea. I mean, the... I think part of it is why did the Democratic Party embrace this so quickly uh, and so readily is because why wouldn't they? It, when it's so easy to, for many people to say, I'm a victim, that's why my life's not working out. I'm a victim. And there's a party that recognizes that I'm a victim. My agency, take it away. You know, it, it, it's, it's giving up. It's... It's surrendering. It's, up. it's basically saying, and you can understand that human nature would lead a lot of people to the conclusion that they really cannot navigate life on their own. Yeah. They need a big brother to make decisions for them, to put enough money in their bank account to survive, to tell them what to eat, where to go, what to wear, everything. Even like who that. to in, be in the mm. nanny state and what it is acceptable to be and not be, what to believe, what not to believe, and which views are outside the mainstream yeah. of the thinking of most everyday Americans. But well, that, that's, that's the key point, isn't it, Tim? It's uh, this, this whole network has created a, the, the, a postage stamp size set of acceptable opinions and if you stay within that you're safe and you're protected if you venture outside of it you're demonized you're ostracized actually that's something i'd like to talk about in our next segment on this but one more question on this topic tim we, we discussed that black lives matter basically went bankrupt special type of bankrupt where they keep the mansions um but thanks for reminding us of that again i just thought i'd point that out that can never yes. be mentioned enough leave but the mansions take the cannoli absolutely yeah, uh, there's cookies. No. Um, but DEI. Oh, it's an adoption, adaption. Yes. DEI. Anyway. That's the new yeah. BLM, right? The the people who yes. came up with this concept, they've just shifted into corporate DEI, haven't they? Yes. Yes. That's the uh, sort of application uh, of the principle, mm. right? That's weaponizing it for individual organizations, DEI. What they've done here is they put diversity first, which everybody has to agree with, and mostly does. 
And they put inclusion last because, again, that's something nobody's going to say, I don't want inclusion. Mm. But what they do is they sandwich the real poison pill right in the middle, which is equity. Yeah. So the average person looking at it says, well, who could fight the idea of equity? Folks, there's a difference between equality and equity. Equity means that there has to be an authority that steps in to guarantee outcomes for people that self-identify as oppressed by virtue of their race. That's, course, yes, that's Of course, it. The, the other reason is, Tim, that if they had it the other way around, it'd be D-I-E, and that's just, just giving the game away for them. Uh, okay. we, yes. We'll be right back with Tim Donner after this short break. Don't go anywhere. We dismiss history at our peril. Liberty Nation Radio with Mark Angelides. News that didn't quite go under the radar this week, but was surprising to many, was that the No Labels vehicle, which had threatened to run a unity candidate in the 2024 election, decided to close up shop. But they'll still be working on other projects, I'm sure. But they quoted as their reason that they couldn't find a candidate. Now, reading into that, they couldn't find a unity candidate. We're back with Tim Donner, Liberty Nation's uh, senior political analyst and longtime host of this here show. Uh, and Tim, I'd love to get your opinion on why they couldn't find a unity candidate. Well, they tried by most accounts something like 30 different potential candidates and every single one of them turned them down. Now, why? Uh, number one, I think, is the clear idea that they had no chance to win. Uh, number two, that Anybody from either party joining that movement would be ostracized for the rest of their political career. Uh, and you've got to throw in number three, the Democratic Party, for one, uh, was not hesitant in releasing so-called private memos, mm. uh, threatening anybody that, you know, was dancing to any degree with the no labels movement or any kind of independent candidacy. So, I mean, the no labels movement itself went through several iterations. Yeah. The first was a hopeful, hey, people want something different than Biden and Trump, and these people can get ballot access and they can provide it. And then it was a mortal threat to uh, Joe Biden because it looked like Joe Manchin would be the guy, and he is the He's the bookend to Joe mm. Biden in the Democratic Party. Then they thought it might be someone like a Larry Hogan, who is a, uh, an anti-Trump Republican, former governor of Maryland. And then it kept changing and changing. And then Robert F. Kennedy Jr. became an independent instead of a Democrat. So by the time that no label said, sorry, we just can't really get anyone who's willing to do this, um, it seems to me clearly that it's to Trump's advantage because mm. with Robert F. Kennedy Jr. going leftward with his uh, vice Nicole, presidential pick, Nicole Shanahan, yep. Shanahan, who is uh, a self-proclaimed progressive, uh, what you have now is you have four left-of-center candidates on the ballot and one Republican, Donald Trump. So by no labels... Uh, deciding not to field a candidate. What that means is the Nikki Haley wing, the anti-Trump wing of the Republican Party and moderates, the so-called double haters who hate Trump and Biden, they have no place to go. So yeah. I think that this clearly uh, benefits Donald Trump in the end, if think, only yeah. on the margins. Absolutely. Uh, now, I had a, a theory on why the no labels effort collapsed. And that's, it's it's more speaking to the tune of it. And uh, I, I wrote about this on LibertyNation.com. And uh, as you know, you've read the piece. Uh, a, and, and really, I think it's it's a uh, it's an analysis I haven't read anywhere else. And I agree with it completely. So thank you. Professor, teach us. <laughs> so the, 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 the professor like Dr. Jill uses it, right? Yeah, um, no, please, please so no. My, my theory here is that nobody wants a unity candidate now because there's so much rancor there's so much to be sorted out within the country that 
unity is not something for this election. Uh, and I've, I've kind of been thinking more on that since writing the piece. And I, in, in my mind, tell me what you think of this. Uh, I, I think that if Donald Trump loses uh, in this November, then the right wing of American politics will go away and say that, uh, okay, this form of Trumpism, this uh, this America first thing, it's not working. We couldn't make it in two elections. We need to reform as a centrist party. And then they'll run straight down the center of politics and they'll win in 2028. Or, so Joe Biden loses and then the left wing of the country, they go away and think, well, we, we couldn't compete with all these... Uh, with, with the right, because we've got all these far left policies as the progressive stuff as we talked about earlier. And then they'll basically reform and come back dead in the center and the center and will I, win. And, Either way, the center will win come 2020. Well, there are a couple of particularly prominent examples of this in recent political history. Mm. In 1972, when George McGovern ran against Richard Nixon, who was seeking a second term, I mean, he was so far out on the left, he actually lost the election by 24 percent in the mm. popular vote. He he was termed the candidate of abortion acid. And I'm trying to remember what the third one was, but it was not complimentary. Sure. <laughs> and uh, so the Democratic it was a disastrous mm. year for the Democratic Party. Now, admittedly, there was Watergate in between. But in 76, they went hard to the center mm. with Jimmy Carter. And the same thing happened after Michael Dukakis was just destroyed in the 1988 election by George H.W. Bush, the Democratic Party uh headed straight for the center with Bill Clinton, and he won two terms. So there's plenty of precedent for a party that loses a shattering, definitive, defining election, which this will be for probably yeah. both parties, uh, to regroup and reform and present a different image going forward. I would suspect that if Trump loses, uh, we would see Nikki Haley rise to prominence because she was second in line and she outlasted you know all the men yeah uh other than trump and that's sort of a bit of a back to the future back to the george w bush era of neo 1987 called they want their policies yeah. back. <laughs> uh, but i don't think that the party will ever quite return to mm. the neoconservative days of the 20 uh the early 2000s the first decade of the 2000s yeah it, it's it seems to me that uh there were no lessons to be learned in 2016 or 2020 because the margins were so close so th th there wasn't let's go away regroup and rethink our strategy everything was just so close the democratic party was still reeling from not having hillary clinton as their president uh, and I think, it, it, I think it's safe to say that in 2016 and in 2020, the losers and the winners in both, none of them were mm. satisfied that the outcome was real. I'd say that's a fair assessment. Tim Donner, thanks ever so much for joining us. Always a pleasure, Mark. Thanks. We dismiss history at our peril. Liberty Nation Radio with Mark Angelides. Since the overturning of Roe v. Wade, abortion has been top of the election cycles, especially for the midterms, which many people say was a referendum on abortion in America. Now, with Donald Trump as the almost certain contender for the uh, Republican nomination this year, 2024, uh, he's announced his ideas for dealing with abortion. Now, uh, somebody who's really followed this very, very closely, and I've done a lot of writing this on the page of LibertyNation.com, is Liberty Nation's editor-at-large, Jim Fight, who's been following this ever so closely and who joins us here today. Thanks for being here, Jim. Thanks for having me, Mark. So, Jim, Donald Trump on, I believe it was Monday morning, he, he announced that he was having a press conference and that he was going to give out his position for, if he wins the presidency in November, mm -hmm. what he's, his position is going to be on abortion. And what was that position? Uh, that position was 
it's a state issue. He's he's not supporting a uh, after as it turns out he's not supporting a state ban after all. I mean, uh, I'm sorry, a federal ban after all. Mm. Uh, and and I word it that way because you know a week or two ago he was talking about. I guess it was last week. He was talking about how he would he'd tease this announcement. He said, you know, soon he didn't give a date, but he said soon I'm going to announce my position on uh, on a na- you know on on abortion on a national abortion ban. And he, and he 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 kicked around the idea of 15 weeks, and he said that seems to be where everybody's settling and he, and he said that seemed reasonable but he didn't come out and specifically mm. support it uh he just kept saying soon i'm gonna reveal soon i'm gonna reveal and then and then first thing monday morning later today i'm gonna reveal and then i mean you know almost immediately come out and said what he said but you know it's funny uh, if uh, if this politics things doesn't work out for him he could always get a job as a host of like a popular reality tv style thing maybe even something oh, to do with business what a what a novel concept yeah. <laughs> yeah, get me uh, Mr. Trump on the phone. I, I've got an idea yeah. for him. Yeah, so he really teased this out. But th- the funny thing is here, so his position is directly in line with what the Supreme Court ruled in the Dobbs versus Women's Health decision, which overturned Roe v. Wade, right? Yeah, pretty much. Uh, I mean, the the explicit language in that ruling, uh, I don't have it right in front of me, but they, they, they use words like the people's elected representatives. Mm. Um, so you could make the argument that, okay, well, if Congress, if the U S Congress passed a law, that'd be one thing. But, uh, but the general idea here was to get the U S government out of it and return this to the States. So it's funny that you put it that way. It's to get the U S government out of it and put it back to the States. Now, one of the, one of the big slogans that you always see on, uh, on signs at, uh, I guess, pro choice protests uh, or rallies uh, mm-hmm. is, is you know keep keep uh, government out of my body. There's, there should be there should <laughs> be no yeah, there should yeah. be nothing to do. You know we don't need these old men in Washington having any say on my body because because it's my choice. But right. here's the thing, right? They it seems to me that that particular side of the argument would welcome a federal ruling through Congress. Obviously, you can't do it with uh, executive order, but. Right. To, to get Congress to, to pass laws on this. Um, and so it's not really keep these people out. It's keep out the people that, that don't agree with what I say, which is, it, it's an odd way of thinking about it. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's, it's make, make sure the right old white men <laughs> yeah. in Washington make, get to make the decisions, not the wrong ones. Uh, Absolutely. So here's the thing. You actually wrote uh, about this in advance anyway, and you, you pretty much nailed it well before... Donald Trump actually made his announcement because you, you did an a- analysis of what you, you thought he might do. And you pretty much mm-hmm. came to the conclusion that he'll push it back to the States because that's where it is, because it would be too difficult to do anything else. Right. It, it'd practically be impossible. Well, yeah. I mean, constitutionally, I mean, there's, like I said, you could, you could make the argument that uh, if the U S Congress passed a ban or on the other side of the argument, if they passed a protection, Yes. Uh, and I and I make that point in that article you're talking about. Um, that this doesn't just apply to a ban on abortion. This uh, this applies to a protection on abortion as well. Um, <clears throat> you know that, that that maybe that would be okay. But the problem there is, I said there's you got you got three three routes to a federal abortion ban or protection. That's a a, re, a, a reinterpretation by the Supreme Court, which isn't likely to happen anytime soon. I mean, it took 50 years to overturn. Uh, Roe v. Wade, and uh, sure, but Joe Biden's planning on adding another four justices, from what I <laughs> well, well, you know that that might help if he could pull that off. But <laughs> sorry, please continue. No, that's fine. Uh, route number two is Congress passes a law. Mm. Well, that's unlikely to happen because in the Senate you're going to have to have um, super majority you know, of sixty out of right? hundred. Yeah, mm. and that's that's well, hey, we're two hundred and some odd years in and don't have one, so there you go. Uh, yeah. And then uh, the other option, of course, is a, is a constitutional amendment, which is mm-hmm. even harder to get passed than a law through Congress. Uh, just just so to clarify, to, what does a constitutional amendment take? That is, well, a con- uh, there are two ways to get a constitutional amendment. One is through a uh, what we call a con. Here lately, we've been calling them con cons, which is constitutional convention. Sure. But uh, but anyways, and that's where enough of the states have to have to vote at the state le- level that we need to have a convention. Uh, and so that kind of bypasses Congress. The other way is of course, that Congress pass an amendment, which requires ratification uh, even more of Congress to, 
to be on with it. And then, of course, after Congress does say, hey, you know what? Yeah, this is good. Let's have this as an amendment. Then the states have to ratify, uh, you know, enough states have to ratify. And uh, and so that's you I mean, that's that's rare. We have 26 uh, amendments uh, out of. I mean, thousands of attempts. I, I forget the exact number. It's like 20,000 attempts or something like that. It's a lot. Uh, <laughs> but it doesn't happen often, sure. which is, you know, thank God. Yeah, but, I'm, uh, I'm still holding out hope for the two mules and an acre. Uh, right? land. <laughs> so, Jim. You know, at current levels of federal spending, that would almost just be a, just, you know, just a whatever kind of thing. You know, Absolutely. Yeah. Where are my mules? Drop in the bucket of, of current federal spending. So, I, I think that Donald Trump is, for all these reasons you've just enumerated, it is right that this has got to stay with the states, right? The Supreme Court says it's got to stay with the states, his position that it stays with the states. Now, I guess that brings us on to what will the government do now? Uh, Joe Biden is already obviously working on whatever he can with this particular the abortion issue. Um, but are there things that he can do via executive order in terms of for example, uh, punitive uh, actions against hospitals or uh, colleges, for example, if they receive federal funding, if they, they don't, for, just for example, uh, in a place where maybe uh, uh, abortion is, let's say, outlawed, uh, but they don't allow people to leave the state to go and get an abortion elsewhere, uh, but they receive government funding. Is that the kind of thing that we can expect? Or almost like... A, Nipping at the edges well, the, of, you know, I see where you're going with this. Mark, Laura's. And it wasn't that long ago in the course of history. Uh, and a lot of us, you know, I'm, I'm not an old man by any means, but, uh, you know, it was within my lifetime that, uh, you know, there, there was a time when, when the, uh, the, the legal age to buy alcohol was, uh, was 21 in some States and it was 19 in others and it was 18 in others. And the way that they, managed to f to basically push that through to to have a, a unified 21 years of age as the minimum age to buy alcohol in the U.S. was it was unconstitutional for a federal law to uh, to regulate that because, well, the, the U.S. government was never intended to regulate individual behavior. Sure. That's to the state governments. But but what is 100 percent entirely within the government, the federal government's power is to withhold federal money. And that's what they did. They said, hey, you know, you will either pass state laws that raise the drinking age to this, or you can say bye bye to highway money. And <laughs> and uh, and that that worked. And then here very recently, just in the last few years, it worked for raising the age to buy tobacco products to 21. Mm. So it's uh, we can I guess we can expect this to see this coming down the line, especially if um, should Joe Biden win a second term. It, yeah, I certainly wouldn't be surprised. That That's something that we can uh, expect to see coming down the pipeline. Uh, that is, uh, is certainly more fodder for articles for Jim Fight, editor-at-large at LibertyNation.com, that he'll be covering this beat in particular. He does some great writing on it. I do recommend you go and check that out. Jim, thanks ever so much for joining us. Thanks, Mark. We dismiss history at our peril. Liberty Nation Radio with Mark Angelides. With some startling new developments out of Ukraine, we're joined by none other than Liberty Nation's national security correspondent, who's a former principal deputy undersecretary of defense controller and somebody who has all the wherewithal, all the information on national security issues. Dave, thanks for being oh, Dave Patterson, thank you for being here. Thank you, Mark. Always happy to be with you. So, Dave, something that really caught my eye over this last couple of weeks is that the the war in Ukraine between Russia and Ukraine, obviously. Um, it, it seems to be entering a, a new phase, and it's not a good one. Uh, specifically, I'm referring to there's uh, talk in the parliament, uh, there's legislation to to lower the age for conscription. So presently, uh, it's everybody over the age of 27 up until I, I think it's somewhere in the early 50s. Uh, and now they're looking at lowering it from 27 to 25. So people who are essentially just fresh out of college also being included in the draft. And that, that, that really tells me something there. That tells me that wherever all the other people gone, they've either been killed or injured. Uh, and now 
they're expending the last vestiges of the youth in Ukraine to continue fighting against Russia. What's your take on that? Well, my take is that um, when you're running out of people, you have to to do something. And uh, lowering the age of the draft seemed like the most reasonable thing to do. But keep in mind that uh, during the Vietnam War, when the United States had conscription, that 18 Mm. was the uh, age at which you registered for the draft. So those of us who remember that look at 25 as being... uh, not that bad. It's, sure, uh, I, I can see it from that point of view. But the, the other side of that is, who's going to be left in Ukraine when all this is over? Because there's the, the former Soviet bloc nations, that they already had a, th- this population demographic was already historically quite low across these countries because of the crushing poverty in the 90s. Um, so people didn't have that many children. So there, there's people losing their lives on in this tragic, tragic war. And who's going to be left in the country afterwards, I think is the question, isn't it? Yeah, I think, that, I mean, it's obviously a good question, but at the same time, uh, the reality is, okay, what else are you going to do? If you are... Yeah. Uh, interested in in retaining your country and your sovereignty against this brutal uh, invasion from uh, from Russia, what what other recourse do you have? Yeah, that that's that's an incredibly valid point. That is the other side of the 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 argument there, uh, and I think maybe the the middle point that is is to try and sue for peace. Now we're more than two years into the war. Now, do we have any? idea of how peace talks or settlement or resolution talks have been going? Well, I don't think they've been going well if they've been going at all. But here, here's what the Ukraine actually has uh, to, to deal with. I mean, these are the chips that they have. Uh, they have what uh, President Zelensky would wish were true, and that is that Russia gets out of... Crimea, the Donbas uh, Oblast, and goes back to uh, pre-April of 2014. Uh, that's an unrealistic point of view, I think. Yeah. Uh, at the same time, so their chips are NATO membership and some portion of the Donbas to uh, to retain for for Ukraine. I don't think that. Uh, that Russia is going to give up Crimea under any circumstance and would, uh, would, would escalate the war uh, in a way that nobody wants to see happen. Let, let's, let's delve into the NATO thing. So we've heard uh, recent chatter about NATO uh, accepting Ukraine as a, a full member, which I, I, I might not have this right, but I don't believe that that can happen while there's an ongoing conflict so all the statements from the american side at the moment it's all i I presume that they're talking about after the conflict is resolved then ukraine will become a full member with all of the uh, article rights and treaties is that about right i I think that's that's right uh secretary of state blinken recently when during his european tour uh was a little bit more positive about uh ukraine becoming a member uh some of you know obviously new europe is far more enthusiastic about ukraine becoming a member sooner rather than later the baltics uh lithuania you know estonia latvia and uh now uh, Finland, Sweden, and Norway, they have a, a different view of things than uh, uh, what uh, S- Secretary of Defense uh, Rumsfeld used to call Old Europe. Mm. Uh, and and they're more likely to think about uh, Ukraine as, as a member than more, sooner rather than later. There's a, another element that's, that's sort of crept in, which had been totally dismissed early on in the war, and that is uh, France and saying that, that they might be open to put NATO troops in Ukraine. 
Uh, mm. I don't. I think that's a non-starter for, particularly for the United States. Uh, but the fact that they're talking about it, I think, is uh, interesting. Lord David Cameron, the former Prime Minister, who boss of the Foreign Office, essentially, and he's planning a visit to America to have a sit-down meeting with Joe Biden, President Biden, and of course, Speaker of the House Mike Johnson. It's believed that his position is that the U.S. needs to to break the deadlock on funding and send money to Ukraine. Now, I don't know quite how Mike Johnson is going to navigate that because there is a growing uh, disaffection with handing over cash without the uh, an end game in sight. Uh, so how do you think that's going to go? I I think that will probably go as well as uh, it has in the past. Um, when uh, starting in November, when President Zelensky came over, with, you know, I, I call this the uh, uh, the tin cupping campaign. Yeah, we're <laughs> coming for uh, for for money from the United States, and after Zelensky, you had uh, uh, Jan Stoltenberg, you had the president of Poland, and and most recently, you know, you're going to have uh, the the UK coming over with pretty much the same message. Mm. The problem is not, in my view, with the uh, with the Congress. The problem is with President Biden, who has who could easily dispense with the the acrimony and and the problems within Congress by simply coming out and saying this is our goal this is our objective and we have a strategy which says we will do xyz in order to achieve an end game and people then can say well I agree with it or I don't agree with it but at least they know where the United States is going as opposed to throwing money at something that is is, is unknown it's a, it's a it's a hole into which Taxpayer dollars are going without an end state in, in, in view. You know, I, I think you're right with that. The, it, it seems that if Joe Biden said, look, here's 150 billion more dollars, that's it. And, and that's what we're giving. And, and this is the goal that's going to be achieved by handing over this 150 billion dollars. And then it will be done. That'll be the end. I mean, it's, it seems unlikely that, you know, just 150 billion dollars and then the war is over. But uh, if he said, then that's the end. But there's no particular end in sight. Is there? It's like it's one hundred fifty no. million dollars now, and then we'll, and we'll see well, what else. Well, it's, the the supplemental is six, sixty billion dollars is on the table in the uh, yeah. in, in the U.S. Uh, appropriation supplemental. But there's another aspect to this that I find encouraging, and that is uh, Jan Stoltenberg's proposal that the uh, NATO and EU establish a fund of a hundred and I believe it's a hundred billion euros. Uh, for support to the Ukraine, and with that, uh, taking some of the leadership authority away from the United States and what's become known as the uh, Ramstein Group, mm-hmm. and and placing that uh, responsibility more into uh, the hands of uh, of the NATO as a group, and I think you can legitimately look at that and say that uh, the uh, NATO leadership and uh, others in the EU are uh, dissatisfied uh, with the leadership and the the way in which the United States has, uh, has approached this whole problem of Ukraine and want more authority for tactics and strategy, even on the uh, battlefield, to rest in, uh, in NATO hands versus uh the u.s yeah i think uh if the current administration's foreign policy history is anything to go by anything that removes decision making capability is probably a positive advance dave uh oh my gosh yes dave patterson thank you ever so much for joining us thank you mark happy to be with you and that's about all we have time for on this week's edition of Liberty Nation Radio Heard Coast to Coast on the Radio America Network. I've been your host, Mark Angelides. I'd like to thank our guests for today, Tim Donner, Jim Fight, and Dave Patterson. And of course, you at home for taking the time to tune in and join us. Thanks for being here. We dismiss history at our peril. Liberty Nation Radio with Mark Angelides.